Hello. So, I know I usually do this in my office chair and I do a little roll in, but I'm currently standing, so just bear with me also, just to get this out in the open. I see my hands, yes, they are orange. Yes, it was an unfortunate self-tanning accident. We will be moving right past that. As we all know, I have some pretty strong opinions about the things that are currently happening in America specifically, but in the world in general. And uh, these messages that I record are usually pretty loud, pretty aggressive, pretty um, pretty off-putting if you disagree. After talking with some people, I think that what I really wanna do is not just a, you know create conversation with people that agree with me because that's important, but I think what's also really important is getting people who don't agree with me to listen to what I'm saying. So I'm gonna try and take a little bit of a different approach other than basically calling people ignorant. The goal here is kind of to do a series of videos um, that take some of the issues that we're dealing with in very political, um, hot button, tense ways and kind of put them in smaller situations or groups and talk about them that way in the hopes that it will be more palatable of a conversation if we don't bring Democrat, Republican, um, those kinds of things into the mix. I'm sure some of these will probably still get me blocked by some people, but I am totally okay with that. So without further ado, I present to you, look at it this way. So for this first video, um, I was kind of inspired by a documentary series that I've been watching. It's on HBO Max. It's called This Is Life with Lisa Ling. And the episode that I just watched most recently, season three, episode three, if anybody has the app and would like to investigate for themselves, um, it was about heroin and not just the drug itself but the way the different ways that that drug has hit different communities this particular episode focuses on the city of chicago and its more predominantly white suburbs lisa goes and investigates both sides of it so she starts out in a small predominantly white suburb and she goes and meets with their police chief and they have a very nice discussion in which she learns that the police station there has this program where if you are really struggling with addiction, you can come in. It does not matter how many drugs you have on you. It doesn't matter if you have paraphernalia. It does not matter. If you come in and you say, here I am, I desperately need treatment, like take my drugs. They will go and destroy your drugs and paraphernalia and then subsequently pay for you to attend rehab. That is, that's crazy. There's no, there wouldn't be no arrest. There will be no jail time, nothing. The focus is getting you help for your addiction. Later, Lisa goes and visits a county jail and it is a predominantly black population. She sits in on a meeting and one man, he's 51 years old, stands up and he's talking about his struggle with addiction. And he says, I've been in and out of jail 37 times. He's 51, y'all. That is, an incredible amount of time of his life spent in jail. And Lisa asks him and says, how do you feel about the fact that there's a program just right down, you know, right 30 minutes away that allows the young white inhabitants of the community to get help immediately and not even have to go through this. He says that he feels really cheated. Another man gets up and says, this is bullshit. And, you know, she sits there and listens to their stories and the disparity in treatment between the community of young white people and the prison is just incredibly evident. Because if you think about it, do you really believe that that man, that 51 year old man, if he had had the opportunity to go to rehab in the beginning, 40, 30, you know, however many decades prior, if he had had the opportunity to walk into his local precinct and say, I am struggling, I am ill, please help me. If he had had that opportunity, do we really think he would have returned to jail 36 subsequent times? Once again, the disparity is not even in whom is affected by the addiction. The disparity is in how our communities respond to the addiction differently based upon people's skin color. So did the, did the predominantly white community have more money and more funds with which to create such a program? 
Yes. Did the predominantly black community that that 51 year old man came from have those same funds? No, that is another issue that we will possibly get into in a later video. But right now what I'm talking about is directly, you are comparing apples and apples, right? These are both people that are suffering from the exact same thing. And yet one group is looked at as sick and needing help. And another group is looked at as being criminals. And if you will excuse the sass for one moment, if you don't see the disparity or don't think that that is significant, or you think that the group that is criminalized deserves it, then you perhaps need to re-examine some of your opinions. Looking for some numbers here, here's, here's a stat. The National Academy of Sciences released a report that said only 5% of opioid addicts that are imprisoned receive medication treatment for their addiction. So if we're going back to Lisa Ling, nearly all of the heroin addicts in the prison that she got to speak to were black. So not only are they not being offered treatment initially, they are not being offered comprehensive treatment once they are incarcerated. So recidivism rate, what do we think is gonna to happen to that? Whenever they aren't treated at the beginning, they aren't treated in the middle and the end, there is no end. They just end right up back in prison. The whole point, right, is that this isn't a political conversation. This, this conversation right now that I'm having is one of empathy. This is one of looking at a situation that is clearly unjust, clearly unfair and clearly biased towards one set of people and saying, hey, that's not fair, that's not right. Go with me because my hope is that if we can pull out some of these smaller situations, if we can isolate some of these issues that are very clearly displaying inequality and very clearly showing disparities in life, in experience between the black and white populations of the United States, that it will become easier for people to look at the larger issues, look at police brutality, look at systemic racism as a whole, and realize that saying systemic racism has become kind of a, 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 a catchphrase, right? But what that really looks like are smaller things like this. So if we can put all of the little puzzle pieces together and kind of look at all of the situations in which these inequalities exist, maybe, I'm hoping, people will hear what systemic racism really means. Lighting has changed a little bit because I had to pull my blinds down a little bit because my neighbor is currently walking around without a shirt on and it is a horrifying sight that I'm trying to avoid as I'm recording because I don't currently have a ring light and I am recording in my window. So to conclude before I lose all my light, um, Every few days I kind of hope to break down an issue like this, a, a small, take a story, take um, someone's personal account and address it in a way that hopefully will encourage some productive conversation um, between people who disagree. So if you don't typically agree with me and you made it this far in the video, thank you very much for watching this far. If you do typically agree with me and you usually watch all my videos, what's up? Um, either way, please comment um, and if you feel so inclined, share so that we can get more people talking. Um, if you have also any topic ideas that you think are worth addressing, totally message me directly. Um, so yeah, thank you and talk soon.